Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, Ambassador Knight, for uh, honoring us uh, in this uh, international conference. It's really a pleasure to host you here. And uh, as you know, uh, it's not by coincidence that we are conducti conducting the uh, uh, World Summit on Counterterrorism on the symbolic week of the 11th of September as an annual uh, 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 memorial to this uh, horrific atrocity, maybe the biggest atrocity of terrorism uh, ever. And I believe that everyone in the room, uh, including myself, can immediately remember exactly where we were and what we did uh, when this horrific attack uh, occurred. I, for once, was in the United States giving a lecture under the title Stopping Suicide Terrorism, the Israeli Challenge. Actually, the title was not relevant on that day because it was American Challenge, Global Challenge, and, and, and so on and so forth. So I would like to start by uh, asking you, uh, can you share with us uh, your recollection on this horrific date of uh, 11 of September 2001? Um, well, first of all, Professor, thank you for having me. Um, I want you to know, after we, you and I met yesterday, I had your book in my hand, and I called President Herzog and said I was coming to speak uh, today here. He said, first of all, I don't know why they didn't invite me. Uh, no, that's not what he said. But he did say, I am going to be interviewed by the foremost expert in the state of Israel and presumably the world on terrorism. And he was speaking about you, so congratulations to you. That's from the president of the state of Israel. Um, you know, I'm leaving here to go to Jerusalem uh, to do a commemoration of the 9-11 for, as you know, Israel has a beautiful memorial uh, for the victims of 9-11. It's actually the only other memorial outside the Twin Tower Memorial that actually has every name of the 2,977 victims of 9-11. So that's the bonding between the United States and Israel. I um, was there. I wasn't, I was 12 blocks away. Uh, I was uh, in my office in our boardroom and we could look at the Twin Towers from our boardroom and um, it was unbelievable. Uh, once the flames started coming out, we didn't know what was going on. We put, the, we put on the TV at the same time we were watching it and we watched as the next plane drove it itself into the um, Twin Towers. Uh, we had, uh, our firm had 850 people in the Twin Towers, um, 13 of them died. My brother-in-law was at the Pentagon and my wife was at the Capitol. Um, as you know, my brother-in-law did not get harmed in the Pentagon and because of some brave individuals, they drove the plane that was headed towards the Capitol into the ground in Pennsylvania. You know, it's impossible I, to, to, our, to, to tell you what all of us went through as a, as a nation, as a world. Um, my friend Jane Lutz here with her husband, General Lutz, you know, she was the number two at the DHS. She knows because they spent years trying to figure out how this could never happen again. Um, and I think um, as I was looking at my speech for tonight, I kept recalling why security and terrorism and what you're doing is so, so important. Because there are a lot of people out there who still want to do damage to the United States of America and certainly to the state of Israel. So I'm, uh, I was there, I witnessed it firsthand, and I never want to go through anything like that again, nor does anyone in the world, so thank you. So no doubt that this atrocity um, craved this uh, horrific memory in your personal recollection. And I would like to ask you, did the 9-11 attack actually influence in any way your role as the American ambassador to Israel? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I've seen my friend Ronan Barr here, who looks quite good in his jeans. And I should actually dress down a little bit if I was head of a shin bat. But um, uh, uh, listen, it is it is in in. in, in blazing in my mind why they take this stuff so seriously here. Why every day Ronan and, and Mossad and the IDF and how the cooperation between our agencies and our organizations are so important. We share the same goal to stop these people, right? The same goal we wake up every day to understand we have suffered as they have suffered. And the same people who want to do damage to these guys and us here 
are the same characters who want to do damage to us. So we have this, this common bind. I, someone asked me, what is one of the biggest surprises you've had since you've been an ambassador here? I knew fundamentally how close our organizations were, our institutions were. The IDF, obviously, uh, with the defense of DOD and Shin Bet with the CIA and Mossad with our intelligence agency, the FBI. It's beyond that. It's not just the leaders. It's in the soul. It's in our DNA. It's how we operate. And oh, by the way, it's not a one-way street. Far from it. We get as much information and help from the Israelis about our own security as we provide them. So it's a partnership. It's a full, outright partnership. And it should give all of us comfort here as, as organizations and as people who are so experts in the world of terrorism to know that partnership isn't just compl it's completely rock solid. As President Biden constantly say, it's an unbreakable bond. I don't care if it's a Democratic president or a Republican president or members of Congress who are Democrats or Republicans, it's an unbreakable bond and it, it is expressed principally through our cooperation on national security, uh, security for the homeland of Israel and the homeland of the United States. Thank you. So, so let's shift from your personal uh, recollection and your personal uh, observation uh, to more current affairs. Uh, and I think you are getting close to uh, uh, closing the first year uh, of uh, being the, um, the American ambassador in Israel, although we say that in Israel one year it's equal 20 years in a normal country. That is for sure. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, but let, me, uh, let me ask you if uh, at that stage can you uh, identify what you believe is the biggest threat that Israel uh, uh, is facing? Well, I, listen, obviously Iran and their proxies are a fundamental, significant threat to the state of Israel. We, we all agree with that, and President Biden has said over and over, we will not stand by to let the Iranians obtain a nuclear weapon, number one. Number two, as President Biden articulated to Prime Minister Lapid just two weeks ago and has repeated multiple times, we're never gonna tie Israel's hands and what they need to do to defend the state of Israel. Third, obviously we've talked a lot and we can get into a longer conversation about our desire to potentially get into back into the JCPOA under the right conditions, which are the conditions that the president has articulated and yet to have been accomplished. So I think obviously Iran and Hezbollah and the proxies critically important security. But equally as important is what's going on in the West Bank. I spend an inordinate amount of my time trying to keep the vision of a two-state solution alive. Not because I want the Nobel Peace Prize or I think it's, the, you know, it's a nice dining room conversation to have. No, it is because I fundamentally believe to, to preserve Israel as a democratic Jewish state, we must have a two-state solution. And I'm under no illusions here that that's going to happen anytime soon. But you know, I have lots of conversations with Ronan and other people in the government about trying to help the conditions on the ground to make that possible, which means trying to help the Palestinian people and trying to put conditions on the ground to try to make things better, to keep a vision of that alive, and to try to get the parties not to do things that make it more difficult to achieve that goal. So Obviously, Iran is, is in Iran and the proxies and Syria and, the, and Hezbollah and is, is critically important. But I also, we should cannot lose sight of the importance and our humble view in the position of the United States and many in Israel is to keep a vision of two state solution alive. And, and I will tell you, interesting enough, and not to use as an example, but again, um, you know, I've had lots of conversations with Ronan about this. Their decisions on how Israel has looked at Gaza and what they have done to try to keep a not a great situation relatively calm was proven out in this last few months, you know, five weeks ago. Again, I'm not saying that will be the future indication, past performance, not an indication of future performance, but it shows you when you lean in, when you lean in and you try to make things a little bit better, and they can do it through work permits and a variety of other things that they're allowing to happen. Ultimately, when the rockets were flying, as we all know, um, the, you know, Hamas did not engage 
principally in that activity. And we can debate why they didn't. But again, I think it's important for us not to lose sight of the importance of what impact it could have on the state of Israel if the Palestinian situation gets dramatically worse, uh, and certainly in the West Bank and Gaza. And I think the smart people in this government understand that. And we as the United States try to encourage it. Thank you. Some people, especially in Israel, but not only in Israel, um, having this kind of feeling that the uh, Biden administration is turning away from uh, the, the concerns that has to do with the Middle East, not because he's not interested in that, because he has so many other uh, things that trouble him. Um, you can speak about Corona, you can speak about uh, the growing tension between the great powers uh, and so on and so forth. Um, what is your impression? Uh, what would you answer these concerns of, uh, of, of the American friends, I would say, in the Middle East? Um, this is not a diplomatic term, but I'll say it's ridiculous, okay? It's ridiculous. Uh, this administration, we've just we've spent a year plus working on trying to do something on the JCPOA. Again, not necessarily that the Israelis like it or not like it, but we've tried to make an effort. At the same time, dual tracking about what we do if we don't get a deal. The pr we have, as you know, this administration has uh, authorized and pushed aggressively on making sure that the funding for the Iron Dome happen. The president made a trip here to uh, Israel almost three, four weeks ago, which I think, you know, again, I'm a little bit self-interested here, I think was massively successful vis-a-vis -vis presenting that he himself believes uh, that he don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist and articulated a strong commitment to the security of the state of Israel. He then went to Saudi Arabia, again, principally to reinforce the importance of a regional uh, security framework that we need to focus on. Uh, we are enormous supporters of the Abraham Accords. I spend every day working with the Abraham Accords to strengthen the region here. And so the focus and the, and the, and the, and the um, time that we spend, you cannot, as, as Tom Friedman would like to say, um, you may not want to deal with the Middle East, but the Middle East wants to deal with you. Okay, so my, I may have screwed that up a little bit to paraphrase it, but you got the idea. I think the reality of this is we are involved in the Middle East every day, every minute, uh, and trying to solve all the issues here. It's not just obviously Israel uh, or Israel and its proxies. We have things called Iraq. Uh, we have other places around the region that have very difficult situations that we're working on. We're working on the Lebanese situation, the maritime issue, which I'm sure you've read about. So I assure you, disengagement, not happening. Thank you for assuring us. Uh, I know that you are hearing to the uh, um, official uh, memorial event in Jerusalem, so I don't want to hold you much more, but do you have any uh, final comments that you would like to share with this dear audience? Uh, listen, I, I, think, um, I think I said this bef at the beginning of this. Um, the bond between our two countries, not just because I happen to be the American ambassador, is I think, I think People don't understand. It's um, it's sort of in our soul. It's in the soul of Americans and the soul of the professionals who wake up every day. And it's because we have an enormous amount in common. We're both democracies. We care deeply about democratic values. Uh, we're not perfect. Neither the United States or Israel is perfect. Let's make clear. Uh, people criticize us all the time, both countries, because we are big, at least we're a little bigger than you are, but we're powerful, and you are powerful. And with that comes a set of responsibilities. And sometimes I get under the skin of some politicians here because I keep pushing. Um, we Israelis have a, have a responsibility here to protect their homeland, to protect their country and the people, but also have a responsibility for the region and for the world. So I am, uh, it's an enormous honor being the American ambassador because you know, you can walk down the streets and, you know, everyone re respects or generally loves America because we love you and we work together to make this world a little bit better place. So um, thank you very much. <clears throat> Ambassador Knights, once again, let me thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, that you took the time and came to uh, honor us and, and be part of this uh, conference. After meeting you personally uh, two days ago, I'm sincerely, uh, um, sincerely uh, uh, um, reassured 
that you would do a lot to uh, enhance and to promote the, this mutual interest between Israel and the United States as the ambassador of the United States in Israel. And I'm also convinced that you will do a lot to promote Israel's security. So thank you for that as well. Thank, thank you. you.